quickly, I was going to tell you a little bit of my personal story and some key points that I've learned over the years. Um, I did write this book here, and I'll pass it around because there's a lot of information about uh, how to grow crops and uh, a lot of production techniques, but very little about how to actually make money running a business. Um, it's published by Chelsea Green. I'll just let people look at it. Uh, it's a little expensive, but usually I say the first page of the appendix will pay for the whole cost of the book, and you can throw the rest of it away. <laughs> the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook, published by Chelsea Green Publishing. Can you buy it here? You can buy it here. There's a bookseller here. It is $34.95 with a CD that's got all sorts of information that will help you do financial templates, a payroll calculator, um, employee charts, a lot of good stuff. How many farmers, just a show of hands, how many farmers in the room today? Okay, hands down. How many non-farm business owners in the room today? Okay, great, thanks. Um, a little history for myself is my wife and I run Cape Farm in East Montpelier, Vermont. We grow 22 acres of certified organic vegetables, herbs, and grains. Uh, we have seven greenhouses. We hire a few people during the summer. We sell to the farmer's market wholesale in central Vermont as well as Boston and New York through a growers co-op. And um, we had a CSA for years, but no longer. And I'll just give you a couple of uh, photos here. Can I lift this up? Yeah, still going to work? So these are some pictures of the farm, just to get you an idea of what we do. Um, is that going to work? Um, this is my wife in the greenhouse. We grow quite a few bedding plants for sale. Um, we're kind of our, this, this time of year in Vermont, we're reskinning greenhouses. We sell a very green product. This is my, one of my favorite tools. It's a trolley, which saves an incredible amount of labor. Instead of doing the waiter, the waiter waiter style, carrying two at a time, you can carry 25 flats at a time with just a push. We have it going from greenhouse to greenhouse. You can load up the van, you know, slide it outside, go back and forth. Um, pretty much standard organic techniques. We use a lot of compost, um, spread it on the field for cover crops. We use a bed former to um, be as efficient as possible in our planting. You see the springs on the back that mark three parallel rows so we can cultivate with precision. We use some tools like a transplanter to help um, speed up uh, the transplanting process. Uh, this is an electric conversion tractor. It's a 1952 cultivated tractor, which um, I made into an electric tractor, which just so you can all, we're all going to be driving electric cars in 10 years and electric lawnmowers, you've heard, heard it here first. Um, <laughs> they work great, no sound, no pollution, rechargeable, work great. We, in our greenhouses, we have some heated, some unheated. Uh, these are tomatoes that we grow at trellis to about eight feet tall and we get early tomatoes that way um, for local sales. This is an unheated greenhouse and it's kind of amazing how much you can actually crank out of an unheated greenhouse. Um, like the cilantro that I'm cutting right there would get cut out and then the zucchini would overlap it. Um, these are just kind of just more of a sense to give you uh, what we do. We had blight all over New England, so we were pruning very heavily our lower leaves in our greenhouses. And we sell a lot of tomatoes. Uh, this is the farmer's market. It's my son and a friend. And, you know, this is a small city of 8,000 in pooling business. The Vermont's got a great thing going with the local food system. Electric tractor again. My daughter on a, a uh, gas powered uh, cultivating tractor. And we still do some hand work. And for the CSA we would do flowers. That's me on the cultivator product. We'd have um, branding. We'd try to have our image on everything we send out, whether it's invoices, checks, labels. And we're certified organic, always have been since it was around in 1984. That's the uh, telecommunications nexus of Cape Farm, <laughs> called our home. Um, and that's more of the, the kind of the overall view of the farm. So, um, Maggie, for now.
Bernard, could you just put a piece of paper over the projector so we don't have to look at that? Because I'm going to probably use the chalkboard, but go back to this. Now, uh, just a little uh, background. I'm not really sure when I knew when I wanted to become a farmer, but I knew as a kid I was, me and my brother would just be uh, very excited about being homesteaders, and we looked at every Mother Earth news from the very first issue. You know, I went to high school, then I went to college, and um, learned about environmental science there, but then I went to Nepal and lived with a subsistence farm family for four months, and that really kind of changed my worldview quite a bit. Came back and I read Wendell Berry's On Telling of America, and that really started to seal the deal. And then my one of my professors put me on an old farm wall C and had me just to feel the citizen, and there's no turning back at that point. At, when I graduated, I had the opportunity to um, form a partnership with four other people and buy a very rundown farm where I could, um, for a very low entry fee, I only owned 5% of the partnership, but I could rent the farm from them and actually start my own business. And I could pay rent and any money I made or lost was my own. And that was a very, having that low entry ability to get into farming is huge. As a, no one would have lent me money to buy a farm without any knowledge. But this way, I could build up my business. And then over the 10 or 12 years, um, I did build up my business. And the other partners that were involved as landowners, went, you know, they'd, they'd had their families. Two of them moved to California. And you know, they all kind of went their separate ways. And then I borrowed $190,000 from the bank and kind of stuck my neck thinly stretched on a chopping block with an ax kind of hovering over it and really kind of had to um, convince not only the bank but myself that I could do this. You know, there, there were some serious loan payments that I was coming across and, and that's when I first started to really look at the business part of farming. Farmers, you know, farm and myself included because I want to farm. I want to be outside. I want to work on my own. I love working with nature. I love watching plants grow. There's an incredible satisfaction about producing food, you know, but there's this whole other thing that farming is a business and we have to pay attention to that or it's not going to work. And like Jules was saying, you know, you have to pay attention to that or you can't pay your employees, you can't pay yourself, and it's not really that sustainable. So. I would, you know, I've been doing this for 10 or 12 years and I started to get, I had a handle of what was making money, what wasn't. I was growing 40 to 50 different crops. I had greenhouses, I had some different animals. But, it, you know, it was in the winter time when I had time to analyze things that I didn't have the information that I needed. I was thinking like, well, how long did it really take to weed an acre of carrots? How long did it take to wash and pack a pallet of lettuce? Because there's an, I wasn't doing that in Vermont with covering snow right now. And so I would get frustrated. So I really kind of made a point of the business end of it, it was a lot of frustration. And so during the, si during the summer, I set up some simple templates that I could use to collect information during the summer. So then in the wintertime, I could analyze it. And all pretty much um, in the book, it tells a few things. But one of the most important books in my farm is a simple book with a few pieces of loose leaf paper in it with a uh, page for each crop. So anytime I perform a duty on that crop, uh, do anything on that crop, I just write it down. And it's just a record so then later on I can tally up a budget for it. A lot of the work that goes into a, a crop is labor and it's not usually not ever traced except in the form of a paycheck which really doesn't break it down. So I started doing this and um, you know at the end of the year on, on a farm, usually around this time you do a uh, financial analysis, usually because of your Schedule F, and you kind of do a, a simple budget, profit equals income minus expense for your whole business. But in reality, that is just a composite of all the different things you do, whether it's blueberries, sheep, cows, replacement heifers, hay, carrots, beets, artichokes. No matter what it is you grow, all these things on the farm make up this average profit equals income minus expense for your farm. And until you dissect which ones are making money and which ones aren't, you really don't have the control of raising your profitability. And it was one winter when I sat down and I said, I'm going to do this. And, you know, 
I don't know what it is about farmers, but they have like this allergic reaction to business. It's like they'd rather put their head in the sand around finances than actually sit down and sit for three days and actually push a calculator. But so I did, and I forced myself to do it. And you know, in that three days, I was able to raise my bottom line by ten thousand dollars. You know, ten thousand dollars for three days' work. That's not that's not, that's not too bad. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to write something on the chalkboard, and I'll just use my ventriloquist skills to direct my voice into the microphone. But if I, anybody can't hear me, just yell up louder. Okay, so the, the irrefutable business equation is profit equals income minus expense. Okay, you really can't get around it. Now, I went to college, but I wasn't raised in a business family, and it took a while for this to dawn on me. <laughs> it really seems pretty simple. Um, but, and, it, and the thing about this equation, this is like a usually done at year end or at a quarter to figure out what your whole business is doing. But it's really made up of, say, um, different things that are different uh, profitabilities. One might be an average profit from an average income minus an average expense. One might be a very big profit because it's got a very big income with little expenses. Or it could be a, actually a negative profit. You're actually losing money, but you don't know it because you're doing so many things at once and never telling which is which. That you're losing money because you have a small income with a very large expense. But when you average them all together, you have just one equation, profit equals income minus expense at the end of the year. And so, well, what do you do? Well, you can tweak those variables. You can either, the income, you can either raise the price you can increase yield. Expenses, you can cut expenses and that'll increase your profitability, you can do both. Um, or you can just drop the things that aren't making you money. It seems like a no-brainer again that you stop doing things that lose money um, and focus on the things that you are making money. And again, it seems like, uh, it shouldn't seem like rocket science, but it's these realizations that I've had over the years that allowed me to really fine tune my business and I really increased my net profitability. So now, you know, I'm farming for profit and not just being able to produce things. Like this time of year, we're all kind of pouring over seed catalogs and saying, oh, what a great bunch of new varieties. I'm gonna plant this, I'm gonna make a million dollars. Well, maybe, maybe not. And uh, that's why by just looking at these simple equations, you can really increase your, your bottom line. No, that's not. It's because um, the CSA was uh, had to grow everything all the time, and a crew chief of uh, eight years got pregnant and couldn't come back that year, and we decided to shave that off. There's one thing easier to shave off. So once you find out what's profitable, you still have to market it, and I think that's one of the things that is, you know, Jules is alluding to that you, you know, you have to have a market. Uh, if I have something that's really profitable say, um, bunches of kale, okay, I'm going to go plant 40 acres of kale, you know. I go raise my kale, spend all this time doing it, and then I come to market it, and I start knocking on doors, and I go, I'm sorry, but we already have a kale supplier, and oh, yeah, sorry, we don't need that much kale, and oh, who wants kale anyway? <laughs> and, uh, and so then I end up killing in my kale, and in the, in the meantime, while I'm, before I'm killing in my kale, I'm trying to sell it for you know, five cents a pallet because no one's buying it anyway, and then deflating the kale price and all my neighbor kale growers are about to shoot me. <laughs> so it's really important that you target your markets. And I think that you have to have like a, a, a simple marketing plan that takes your products and anticipates where they're gonna go, to which markets, in the correct amounts, and develop relationships. I think that's what Jules is saying is very important. You develop relationships with your buyers and um, focus your efforts on that. And every year you refine it so it gets better. So again, I'm gonna just step to the chalkboard and hope everybody can hear me. What I like to do, now if anything, I want you to take home, I want you to commit this to memory. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what I, what I like to do is make it take a, a simple marketing chart, you know, and I'll just 
talk vegetables because that's what I do, but you can do it with any kind of product that you want. And, you know, I would list across the top the accounts, things like, let's say, a farmer's market, a CSA, a co-op, um, a farm stand, a local store. So these are my accounts that I'm selling to, and then the products that I'd be selling to would be in alphabetical order, doesn't really matter, but beets, carrots, potatoes, you name it, whatever you want. And this list goes down for you long. When I was doing a lot more variety, I'd have like 60 going down this way, and maybe 12 to 15 going that way. I want to do it this simple just so you get a sense of it, how the mechanism works, but for the co-op, you know, I, I go to the co-op's produce manager, and I, and I talk to the produce manager and say, well, how many beets would you use, or are you getting local beets? He says, no, we're buying them from California. I said, okay, fine, I'll take away business from California. No offense. Uh, <laughs> um, and so uh, they'll say, well, we would buy, you know, 10 bags of wheat at this price. And so I say, okay, fine, and over this amount of period, I would, I would write that down. So 10 bags times, say, 10 weeks equals 100 bags. And, you know, that's, I do that with every single crop. And with a CSA, you can do the same thing. You're going to give a pound of beets to 100 members three times, that's 300 pounds of beets. And by doing that, you're actually targeting how much total beets and other crops that you're actually growing. In here, you'd have a total column that would total up all your, all your beats from all your different accounts. And you'd actually, down here, you'd have another total column that would actually give you projected sales to the co-op or to the CSA. And then in this very bottom right-hand corner, you would actually have a grand total. Can people hear me without the mic? I know I should use the mic just to, okay. So um, you have a grand total. And that one page marketing chart is extremely important piece of information about where you're going to be selling all your things. So you shouldn't be planting one single seed until you know where the mar anticipated market's going to be. So if you could uncover that, um, Maggie, please. This is more of a... But this is just kind of a representation of um, what a marketing chart might look like, you know, filled in, and they have columns that go totals across and down. They both cross total at the very bottom corner. And again, it's really important that you develop relationships with your buyers because that's really what is going to keep those sales up. Every year you refine what you're growing. Um, it's really important to do your careful planning in your off season. You don't have much of an off season here, but in terms of, you know, you make your thoughtful planning now and then during the hectic part of the season, you can then just follow the plan and not be out in the middle of the field and say, boy, I think I should plant another acre of beets because I've got extra beet seed in my truck. And that's not the reason you should be doing it. And so it'd be much better to just stick to the plan that you thought out at the common of your desk when you were thinking about it. So kind of to sum up, you know, knowing where you're making the money is really important. Knowing where you're coupled with where you're selling it is a real recipe for increasing your net profit. And net profit is what we're all going to be looking for to do all the things that we want to do with our business so we can be um, proactive uh, in, a, in making a better world. You know, I can pay my employees better. I pay my employees pretty well. I pay myself pretty well. And, um, you know, we're sustainable. We can, you know, treat everyone along the food chain the way they should be treated, the way they should be treated. So, and again, maybe that's why I don't want to scare people off with record keeping and, and um, planning, but it's, it's a real part of the business that we have to, to look at and, um, and focus on. So I think the take-home message is, you know, 
would be, you know, do your homework, you know, research your markets, you know, talk to your bot potential buyers, you know, figure out where that money is going to come from before you plant a seed or um, start your project. And make time to manage your business because you and only you as a business owner are responsible for your business. That is your job. No one else is going to do it. And if you don't do it, your business is not going to work. You need to take time out to be not work in the business, but to be working on the business in terms of doing long-range planning and doing some analysis. And if you have a hard time doing it, make time or get someone, hire someone to bug you to do it. And I think access to resources, especially when you're starting up, is, is almost easier. Instead of ownership, to <coughs> lease land, or it's much better to be a little bit lean and mean at first when you're starting up so you can have the ability to change or quit without losing an arm or a leg behind. And another thing that uh, someone told me after I had been farming for like 10 years and I had this massive flood run on river bottoms, it was really unusual, dam broke in the whole place, lost everything. It was pretty brutal and um, one of my crew had a dad who was in business and he, and he just felt, he came, he came up to me and said, you know, I'm really sorry this happened to you so soon because, you know, business has its ups and downs and there'll be ups and downs and, you know, it's too bad he had such a down so soon, but, you know, you have to, you know, n there are no mountains without valleys and so you just have to anticipate those, not anticipate, but understand that those things happen. <coughs> 